Well, good morning. Oh, my goodness. What a view up here versus over there. This is amazing. Praise the Lord. Are we thankful we're all here together this morning? You know, they had a coronation in England today. Well, we're having one right here because we're crowning, we're clowning King Jesus. And you know what was interesting? Uh, my daughter lives in Belgium, so she was kind of giving me an uptake of what went on because she watched the whole thing over there. And she said this, you know, this little boy came out before the new king came, and he said, the king of kings welcomes you, something to that effect. I thought, hallelujah, because that's the king that really matters, right? Yeah. King Jesus, hallelujah. Have you ever realized how amazing it is that King Jesus, how amazing it is that God, the creator of the universe, would desire to have a relationship with you. And that is the absolute truth. Every single one of you, he desires to have a relationship with us. In fact, it's his idea. He is the one. It says in 1 John 4, 19, we love because what? He first loved us. It was God's idea. It was God's idea that he wanted to have a relationship with you. He first loved us. Loved us. And are we lovable? I could say sometimes, right? We know the truth, don't we? And God knows the truth too. Did you know that? I want you to look at something with me. Look at Romans chapter 3 real quick. Romans 3. And I want you to look at verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. You know, we know that, don't we? We know that for a truth. I'm telling you, it's an amazing thing how quickly sin is a part of our lives. Just little kids, little babies even, right? You've fed them, you've diapered them, you've done everything for them, and they're going, wah, wah, right? They just want more of you. And then as they get a little bit older, all of a sudden, a word enters their vocabulary. It's called mine. That little sin nature is active, so very young. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. Because you see, this, the, the God of this world has blinded our understanding until God sets us free, until God removes the blinders and we're able to see the truth. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. You may think, well, I was the one looking for God. No, 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 no. He chose you before the foundation of the world. Amen? That's why some of you are so old. <laughs> You've been known for a long time. There's none who seeks after God. They have all, how many is all? All. all. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none, listen to this, there is none who does good. You see, the world says man is basically good. That is basically wrong. There's none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. There are a lot in our country practicing deceit all the time. Is that not correct? But you see, it's in us. It's that sin nature that we were born with. Thank you, Adam and Eve, right? We inherited the sin nature. But if they hadn't done it, I would have done it when I came around. <laughs> sin is in us. We're, we're dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians says. And then God is the one who had to come in and change things. It says the poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. You know, you can hold your fingers up all day long and not experience peace because the only real peace comes from the Prince of Peace, God himself, and he can give you that peace that passes all understanding. Isn't that an amazing thing that he does for us? I'll never forget the night that I got saved. I was on a date, a hot date, I might add. <laughs> A football player date. 
And this young man was sharing about his relationship with Jesus. We had gone to a Youth for Christ meeting. He was giving his testimony. And I'm sitting there thinking, I want that. I want what he has. You see, I was raised in a Christian home. My parents were missionaries in Brazil. I had heard the word of God all my life. But when I was in boarding school in Brazil as a missionary's kid, one of the missionaries came and she was sharing and she said, I want everybody to take out a piece of paper and I want you to write on that paper. If you were to die right now, would you go to heaven? Well, I put yes, because I knew somebody might see my paper. (laughs) But in my heart of hearts, I didn't know. I had no assurance. Well, this particular night, I'm with this guy. After we, he finished speaking, we got in the car, and we were talking, and I'm just listening to him and looking at him. And <laughs> Seriously, I was thinking about spiritual things because he was talking about God, and he had this relationship with God, and I thought, that's what I want. I want to know God like he does. Finally, we were headed back to my dormitory. I was freshman in college. And as we were going back, he said, let's sing Blessed Assurance. That's a hymn for some of you that don't know. And it goes like this, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, right? Okay, so we started singing. Remember this, I didn't have Blessed Assurance. But as I started singing, God decided that was the moment to open my eyes to the truth that I was nothing, I had nothing, I could offer nothing, but I didn't have to perform for God. I thought I had to be good for God to love me, and I realized that was a lie, that he chose to love me just as I was. And I started crying, and he looked over at me, and he said, what's the matter? I just said, Jesus loves me. And I'm thinking, he's going... He met me at a retreat where I was a counselor. I don't think I was a very good one. (laughs) He said, Janie, have you ever really asked Jesus into your heart? And I said, I don't know. He said, well, let's make sure right now. So right there in that car, we prayed. And I asked Jesus to take away my sin and to come into my heart. And ladies, for the first time, I experienced that peace that passes all understanding. I knew that if I died, I would be with him for eternity, not because I had performed for God, but he had performed for me on that cross. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Romans 5, 8 says this, God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were what? Yet sinners. We didn't have to clean up our lives in order to come to God. That's why in the Billy Graham Crusades, they used to sing, just as I am. I can come to God just as I am. No one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him. That's what it says in John 6, The Father's the one who drew you to himself. You didn't realize that. He was drawing you. In fact, that word in the literal Greek language means drag. Some of you, he really had to drag you, right? And maybe you have children who aren't walking with the Lord. Oh, God, drag them, drag them, get them, God, get them. You know how. He knows how to bring them to himself. And that's the awesome thing, girls. I can't do it with my much babble. God says, be quiet. You know, I have, a do- I have five daughters. My husband was uh, brutally punished all his life with all those girls. He couldn't understand what was going on. We all understood each other, and he's kind of like, huh? Five daughters. Well, this one daughter loves to call me when she's upset. So she called me this one day, and she was very upset. She lives in Belgium and Europe. They don't have a car, and a person had kind of promised them a car and backed out. And she'd been waiting for a year. She was very upset. And so as a Christian mother, I was going to offer her comfort in the form of scripture. Now, you know, maybe God has protected you from something you didn't know about. Maybe that car was bad news. I mean, you know how you start trying to do that as a mother? She said, don't mention the God word. Mm -mm. I don't want to hear it. 
because she was mad. She was upset. Who was she blaming? She was blaming God. God, what's this? How did you do this to me? Isn't that the way we go sometimes, right? I can't blame the cats. I want to blame God. So as a mom, as a Christian mom, I'm proceeding to make her change her mind. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and says, shut up. (laughs) Be quiet. Be still. Let me do the talking. And listen, I had to zip my lip. But the awesome thing about God is after I got off the phone, I picked up my little daily light. Daily Light, if you don't know about it, is a book that a man in England many years ago had family devotions. And he, for family devotions, compiled scripture, just scripture, no commentary, just the word of God, scripture after scripture. He put the scriptures together and made a devotional of scripture. And each day you read a morning and you read an evening and it gives the scripture in order. Well, wouldn't you know? God likes to send you telegrams. Did you know that? And for those of you who don't know what telegrams are, text. He likes to text you, right? He has a heavenly cell phone, and he sends you a text. And God said in this text to me, be still, my daughter. And as it, I had it written out, but I forgot to bring it up here. And as it went, it was just all about letting go and letting God. Be still. Trust in me. Rest in me. Give it up. And I realized, oh, Lord, this is what you're saying to me. But let me tell you something. It's a test. Do we like to shut up? Do we like to give our two cents? That's the way mamas work. And God was saying, let me take care of it. I've got this. I know what I'm doing in her life. I'm teaching her something that you can't teach her. And so I had to shut up. It was hard. (laughs) But I also knew where to go. I went to the Lord in prayer. (laughs) Ha ha, sick God on him. That's what's good, you know. So I went to the Lord in prayer. I got my husband. We were a two team with that, praying for her. And a couple of times down the road, she called me back. She said, Mom, I had to ask God to forgive me today. I said, glory, hallelujah. God got the victory. He's so faithful. So it's God who draws us to himself. It's his Holy Spirit that drags us. It says, no man can come to the Father except the, I mean, come to Jesus, except the Father draws him. 1 John 4.10. Let's turn there. 1 John 4.10, if you have your Bible. And it, to make, you know why I ask you if you have your Bible and you look? I tell you what, I might be lying, right? You have to look to the truth to say, oh, she was reading that right, correctly, okay? So 1 John, and look at chapter 4 and verse 10. In this is, well, let's go back to nine. You know, it's so good. Sometimes I have to just go all the way up to the top. Verse nine, in this is this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Because girls, we were all doomed. Our sin doomed us to the penalty of death. And we've all sinned. You know, if you think you're not a sinner, I just have a question. Have you ever lied? If you say no, you just did. Okay? We're all sinners. So he sent his only begotten son that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, that is a big word. In fact, you can impress somebody today. Say, we talked about propitiation. (laughs) It has two meanings that are fabulous. The first meaning is this. Giving the sinner who believes perfect righteousness. We just read in Romans 3, we have no righteousness in and of ourselves, do we? There's none good. 
But when I trust Jesus as my Savior, saving me from the penalty of my sin, which is death, when I trust him, he gives me his righteousness. In fact, in Isaiah, it describes it as a robe of righteousness. Robes are great. They cover a multitude of sin, right? We put on a robe, it covers, right? Well, we have robes of righteousness that Jesus is covering us with so that when God looks at us, he no longer sees the sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. Is that a glory hallelujah or what? Isn't it? Praise God. I love you guys. You guys are action. I love that. Wow. He does. He covers it. So giving the sinner who believes perfect righteousness, number two, and this one's so critical, satisfying God's justice. We talk a lot about the love of God, and that's a reality. God is love. God is mercy. God is grace. But God is also a God of holiness. He's a God of righteousness. He's a God of justice. There's not a whole lot of justice in this world today. My 19-year-old daughter was killed by her boyfriend. And the justice system gave him a plea bargain. He was charged with second-degree murder. He, he said he would, go, would take the plea bargain and he would say voluntary manslaughter, which in itself ought to keep you in jail. And therefore, they let him out. Voluntary manslaughter. He was in jail a few months before the trial and then he was out. And they said, the DA assured us that if he committed one crime, be it even smoke marijuana, back then we couldn't do it for free, you know, we had to be under the law. If he even did that, he would be back in jail 25 to life. He hurt another person. He got six years for that, and then he was out again. And he hurt another person, and he's out now. And I say, where's the justice? And God says, one day he will face the just judge. Right? He will. I will say this. I pray for him all the time. Because I don't want anyone to go to hell. And I pray for him that he will come to Jesus. And that he won't have to face the penalty of his sin. But God is a God of justice. He's a God of holiness. He's a God of righteousness. He says this, be holy as I am holy. And a lot of times we want to talk about that. But it's a truth. It's the balance of who our God is. But aren't you thankful for holiness? Aren't you thankful that he's a God who is a holy God? We can trust his word because it's truth. What he speaks is truth. And so he says he's giving us the Son provided that propitiation for our sins, and now we're covered in his robes of righteousness. The Son paid the penalty for all of us. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? And we didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. It was all God's gift to us. Now, we're going to look at 1 John 4, same chapter, and we're going to look at verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We ought to. What gets in the way? Our corrupted flesh. Because you see, when I become a Christian, God doesn't take my flesh away. I still have a struggle. You know, before you come to Christ, you're ruled by three things. The world, the devil, and your flesh. Hello. And when you come to Christ, it says we're ruled by those things before, but God, who had love and mercy, died for us, gave us victory, gave us life, gave us eternity, but we still have these three enemies. And ladies, if you don't know it yet, you're in a battle. Because these three loved ruling you. They loved being in control. And now that you're saying yes to Jesus and no to them, they're going to fight you at every place in the, in the book. They're going to come against you. And I think my biggest enemy is my flesh. 
My flesh gets in there. You see, my husband has a hearing problem, and he asks me a question, and I answer him very nicely. But then he asks me again. The second answer is a little less nice. By the third answer, my flesh is in there, and I want to kill him. Don't ask me again, buddy. Isn't it incredible how that creeps in? You're not expecting it. And then he's having a hard time remembering stuff. He's very, very smart. I think he's got too much stuff up there. He can't remember anything. And so I'm sitting in my bed one night, I mean one morning, having my devotions. I'm a good Christian. I'm reading the Bible. And all of a sudden that thought came in. He can't hear. He can't remember. I'm so sick of repeating things every single moment. I'm so sick of saying, would you remember so-and-so? And And I described the person. I described what they did, what they said. He goes, no. (laughs) Is that the only answer you can give? Oh, my. I'm just sitting there. I'm like a peacock, you know. (laughs) Me, so wonderful. I can hear and I can remember. I was like a fat sausage. You know, those sausages, when you poke that fork in there and it goes, the grease just comes out. Pride, just just oozing out. And you know what God says in Proverbs 8, 13? He says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil and the evil way. And I go, okay, I'm okay on that one. But then he says, pride and arrogance. And you know what arrogance is? Pride on steroids. <laughs> so he hates evil, evil way. He hates pride. He hates arrogance. And then he says he hates the perverted tongue. Now, I thought that was cussing, and I was okay on that one too. <laughs> but then the Lord showed me, no, no, no. The perverted tongue. The angry tongue. The attacking tongue. The gossiping tongue. The lying tongue. Ooh, yikes. He was taking me to the woodshed. If you're not from the South, you might not know what that is, but I was getting a big spanking. Not that morning, though. I got away with it that morning, and I just sat there in all my pride, ooze, and grease. The next morning, same song, second verse. I'm there reading the word. He can't hear. He can't remember. Ah. Uh. This time, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Are you thankful for the conviction of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Ladies, he didn't just convict you, convict you to bring you to salvation. That's one of the work of the Holy Spirit. He convicts of sin, that we're sinners, of righteousness, that we have none apart from Jesus, and of judgment. There will be a judgment. There will be a reckoning for our sin. But this day, the Holy Spirit was convicting me of pride. Pride is huge. And it was like the Lord whispered in my ear and said, I could remove your ability to remember. Oh, I'm going to get Alzheimer's. I know it. (laughs) Right now I have some timers. Sometimes I remember, sometimes I don't. (laughs) But he was going to give me full-blown Alzheimer's. (laughs) And then he said, I could take away your ability to hear. Oh, Jesus, that would be a tragedy. We would both be going, ah, 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 all day long. Seriously, though, he showed me my pride. He let me see the truth about me, and I thank God for that because I was going down the wrong path. I was listening to my flesh and the lies of my flesh, and the Holy Spirit says, you're not being loving You're not letting me love him through you. You're my vessel. I want him to see me in you. And I was only showing my flesh. And you know, in the book of 2 Corinthians, it says we're to be the fragrance of Christ. And that fragrance of Christ, you know, have you ever had somebody walk by you and maybe they're wearing a perfume that you love? And you're like... You know, you're drawn to it. You're, you're just so touched by that perfume. It just blesses you so abundantly. Well, listen, when I'm walking in my flesh, I am ooh, they stink. 
right? I'm not demonstrating Jesus and Jesus' love and Jesus' character. I'm just showing my flesh, and it stinketh. It is. It did. It does. That's what God does for us. So, beloved, if God loved us, we ought to love one another. It says, verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. I need to abide in him. I need to know him. I need to walk with him. Because in and of myself, if I'm not abiding in the Lord and abiding in his word and abiding in prayer and abiding in fellowship, I'm going to be abiding in my flesh. And like I said, it stinketh. Turn with me real quick to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 7. Go back a bit. I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 7. It says this. We do not preach our... Well, you know what else? I want to go back up because it, it says exactly what I said a while ago. Look at verse 3. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. I said, Satan blinds the eyes, right? Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. That's what you need to pray for your unsaved friends and family. God, remove the blinders so that they can see your truth. And then it says, where we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, he has revealed himself to you. He has brought you to himself. He has drugged you, if need be, to himself. Why? So that you can shine forth his light in the midst of this very dark world. That's what I want to be, a light. You know that little song? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? Okay, I don't want to get y'all started because y'all <laughs> y'all sing forever. I love it. But, right, you're to be that light. Am I a light when my mouth is coming forth with garbage? When I'm complaining and murmuring about everything? No. Let my light shine. Hide it not under a bushel. And this is what God wants to do. And look at verse 7. We have this treasure, this treasure of Jesus, this treasure of light we have in earthen vessels. Did you know that? You're just a clay pot. I'm a cracked pot. But I feel like the cracks allow his light to shine through more so, right? You're an earthen vessel, but you have the treasure of Jesus in you to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. It's not to draw people to ourselves. It's to draw people to Jesus. Because you know what? I can't save anybody. I can't be with somebody 24-7. But guess who can? He can and he is and he desires to be with us all the time. So we have this treasure, Jesus, in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God, not of us. God abides in us. God is love, and his, perfected has, his love has been perfected or made whole or made mature, showing forth from us. God chose to do it that way. He could have done it all without us, but isn't it a privilege <clears throat> that he's given us that opportunity to be that clay pot shining forth Jesus. He loves us and he loves those we're around. You may be the only one that is in somebody's life to show the love of Jesus, to share the light of Jesus. That's why it's so essential that I am abiding in him. Because all too quickly, have you noticed how your flesh is dying to take over? To be in control. I notice this. If I don't start out my day 
taking my thoughts captive, centering my thoughts on him. It's almost a lost cause. Immediately, I'm thinking of myself. I'm thinking of what I want to do. I'm thinking of what I want from others. It's incredible how quickly that flesh takes over. Paul said that in chapter 7 of Romans. I was never so relieved as when I read that chapter. You know what it says? I do what I would not, and I do not what I would. And I'm going, I believe it, brother. I'm in your category. <laughs> right? Wretched man am I. Who's going to deliver me? Jesus Christ. He's the difference. He's the one that can change this rotten character and make it something that's pleasing to God and reaching out to others. And he wants to do this. So back to 1 John. Did you keep your finger there? God gave you 10 fingers. That's till you move around in the Bible, know what you're doing. Okay, so back to 1 John 4 in verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. That's how we know. The Holy Spirit of God has come in, and he is changing us. I can't change myself. Have you ever gone to a conference, and you go home and say, I'm going to be good? <laughs> right? How long does that last? Right? It's like a diet. I'm going to be on a diet Monday morning. No more. I gorged on Sunday, but I ain't eating on Monday. And then by Thursday, I'll start next week. Right? Right? Isn't that the way it goes? I need Jesus every minute of every day. That's the only way I'm going to be what he would have me to be. You know, Jesus was having the last supper with his disciples. It's in John 16. Don't turn there. But he said this to them in verse 6. He said, because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. And you would say, what did he say? Well, he said to them something he had said several times, but they didn't believe. And at one point when he said it, Peter got upset and he said, no, that's not going to happen to you, Jesus. You're not going to die. And then Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, because this was God's plan. That's why Jesus was sent to die for us. So Jesus again had reiterated to them, my time has come. I'm going to be taken I'm going to go through things. I'll be crucified. And then verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is what he's saying to the disciples to comfort them. To, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit will not come. When he comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. When he comes, the spirit of truth he will guide you into all truth. Is that not exciting? Yeah. Ladies, yeah. I'm nothing. I'm, I'm not super smart. But it's so cool that I have the Holy Spirit in me because I can read God's Word and understand it. Why? Because He gives me understanding of the truth, yeah. right? Because He wrote the book, yeah. right? The Holy Spirit wrote through men the Word of God that we have in our hands. And if you don't understand the book, you need to go back to the author, right? He's the author. I remember one time when I was in college, a famous poet, Robert Frost, probably the old, young ones don't know him, but Robert Frost came to our school and he had written poems and we had read the poems and they made us write a thing about what the poem meant as a freshman. So he comes and he was reading some of our uh, thoughts about his poem and oh, elaborate thoughts about what this poem meant. And then he said, I'm now going to tell you what it meant. It was about a horse on a snowy morning, period. <laughs> we had all kinds of things that this poem meant. The snow meant this and the horse meant that. And it was about a horse on a snowy morning. The author of the poem knew what it meant. The author of this knows what it means. And guess what? He comes to live in us so that I've got a constant commentary from the Holy Spirit what this word means, right? Hallelujah. Ooh, I like you guys. Y'all are, are fun. Las Vegas is rip-roaring going. I love it. Woo. Okay. So when he comes, he's going to guide you into all truth. He's going to tell you who, the truth about who Jesus is. He's going to tell you about the truth 
about who you are. That's the truth you don't like to hear sometimes. Have you ever done that? You read your devotions and, right? He sends you that telegram, sends you that text. Hey, you better shape up or you about to ship out, right? He wants you to know truth. He will speak only on my authority. That's what Jesus said. He'll speak only on my authority. He'll tell you things to come. Wow. We all want to know that. But he tells us just enough because there's a trust element there. You see, when this was written, for instance, Peter, we're going to read it down the road. When it was written, they thought Jesus was coming tomorrow. Yeah? Did he? No, because we're here so many years later. We don't know when. Only the Father knows. And he's not letting anybody know the secret, even though some of them think they do. He just wants us to be ready. I want to be ready when he comes. I want to be living for him when he comes. I want to be abiding in his word when he comes. I want to be spreading his light when he comes. Because I don't know when. He keeps that a secret. Because if you knew, you know what you'd do? You'd be mean and ugly until the day he was going to come. <laughs> then you'd clean it all up. Have you ever done that? If you're, if you're married and your husband goes out of town, you don't do a thing while he's gone. <laughs> all those dishes pile up in the sink. The bed's unmade. It's a mess. Or maybe you're at home. You're a housewife. He goes to work. Don't do a thing all day. Till, uh-oh, he's coming home. Right? And like a tornado, you're going through. Right? That's what you'd be doing. If you knew the day and the hour, you'd be saying, I can live it up till then. No, he wants us to trust and rest and lean not to our own understanding. And then he said this, he will glorify me. See, that's what the Holy Spirit does through you. He wants to glorify Jesus. That's why I need to be yielded to him because my flesh glorifies me. It's all about me. But when I am walking in the Spirit, when I am abiding in God, then God shows me it's not all about me. I need to die because I can't help anybody. But the Holy Spirit can do his work through me when I'm dead. Right? That's what he wants. He wants to die. Die to self. Die to me being on the throne. He will glorify me. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance things I've said to you. How many of you have ever heard of Prevagen? It's supposed to help you have a good memory. Well, the Holy Spirit's the best Prevagen pill you'll ever take. He's going to bring to your remembrance. Have you ever noticed that? Something comes, maybe you read your devotions that morning. You're going through your day, and then something comes up. You need that verse. And you go, what was that verse? Oh, the Holy Spirit brings it forth. I heard about this man. He was on an airplane. He was a Christian, but he hadn't been walking with the Lord. But right before he went, his mother said, I want you to get right with God before you get on that airplane because who knows what might happen. He gets on the airplane. They stop somewhere. This is a true story. The airplane took off and crashed. The whole airplane's on fire. He said people were melting in their seats, dying. And he said he started crying out to God and came to his remembrance a verse he had learned years before. When you walk through the waters, I'll be with you. They will not overflow you. When you pass through the fire, you will not be burned. And here he is in the fire. And he's saying, oh, God, oh, God, I will not be burned. I will not be burned. And he was pulling himself. And he was a rather large man, but God gave him the strength. He pulled himself up out of that wreckage and survived. Boy, he needed... Amen. He needed God's word. The Holy Spirit brought it to his remembrance. We old people really need the work of the Holy Spirit. In that. <laughs> Acts 9.31 says he sustains and comforts us. Have you ever experienced the comfort of the Holy Spirit? Oh, I have. Uh, my parents were missionaries in Brazil. They came back for furlough, and then they were going back. My father was a pilot in a very small airplane. They were headed back to Brazil. They were coming out of Chile 
on their way to Argentina and over to Brazil, and the plane hit an air pocket, and it sucked it down. My mom, my dad, my sister were all killed in that plane crash. My little brother was 14 the day of the crash, and he survived. A total miracle of God that he survived. What do you do when the majority of your family is gone? Hallelujah, I had Jesus. He kept reminding me of Psalm 139 where it says this, He knows the days you will live when you haven't lived one of them. You see, I realized God took them home. If I were to go up and say, come back, they would say, no way, Jose. We're going to stay right here. God took them home. They were with him for eternity. And I'll see them again. It's hard. It's difficult. It's painful. But the comfort of the Holy Spirit was there with me every step of the way. God was there putting his arms around me, loving me. And then things we go through life, the Holy Spirit's there to comfort us, to restore many times what the canker worm has destroyed. My husband and I have had a tough marriage at times. I don't know if any of you have. But boy, is it easy when you're strong-willed and strong-willed. Right? I remember I was going to get him an anniversary card. I didn't want to get those that say, you are so wonderful. I got the one that said, God bless you, brother. (laughs) No joke. We were in an impasse. But you see, God, the Holy Spirit, knew how to work in our hearts, knew how to deal with our hearts, knew how to show us that what we both had was a root of bitterness. We're going to talk more about that later. But we had a root of bitterness that only God can take care of. And I love the scripture that says he restores what the canker worm destroys. Our marriage was practically destroyed. We didn't get divorced only because we were Christians. But we also knew God could do a miracle. And he did. We went to a counselor that our insurance provided. She was a Jewish feminist. Uh, My husband told his side of the story. I told my side of the story. She looked at him. She said, sir. You have a right to have the kind of wife you want. She looked at me. She said, I'd divorce him in a minute. My husband said, ma'am, that's not an option. We're Christians. She said, there's not anything I can do for you. Ha ha. That's what the world offers. Here's the solution. Run. But God. Don't ever forget the but gods in the Bible. There's at least 44 of them. But God. God knew, God knew we needed to be knitted together. We needed to forgive each other. And he enabled us to do that by the power of his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit can do a work in us. I have been comforted by God. We are the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. He's no longer in a tabernacle. He's no longer in a temple or even in a church. When I was a little girl, I thought he stayed there. I did. I was scared of him. But I realize now, no, he lives within. He goes with me. He's never, you know, when I dial his number, he's, I'm never on hold. Hallelujah for that. Don't you hate to be on hold? The Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, he sanctifies us. He makes us holy. Only thing holy about me might be my socks. But he is working a work in my heart. That's an awesome thing. He gives us the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever said, oh, Lord, I just want to love. I just want to love. Oh, God, I want to be filled with peace. Oh, God, I want joy. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You can't produce it in and of yourself. Have you ever seen an orange tree tree straining to have oranges? Have you? You'd have orange juice. No, 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 the Holy Spirit does that work in us. It's not me performing for God. It's God doing his work in me, changing me, causing me to die. Oh, that's the part you don't like. He's going to cause you to die. He says that in Romans 8, 28. God works all things, all things together for good. Not all things are good. There's good, the bad, and the ugly, right? 
but he causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 29 says what the purpose is. Are you ready? It's that you die. That's the purpose because he wants to conform you to the image of Christ. He wants to take you, the little lump of clay, and he wants to mold you and make you into the image of Jesus. But that involves death. You have to die to self, die to me, die to wanting my way or the highway. As women, we say that a lot. My way or the highway, kids. My way or the highway, husband. My way or the highway, God, I want a husband. Oh, my goodness. Nobody's happy, right? I had a lady at a retreat. She came to me. She said, I'm single. All my friends are married. All I have is a cat. I'm so lonely. It's just not fair. The next person that came, I'm married. All my friends are single. They have so much time with Jesus. I don't have any time with Jesus. I only have kids driving me crazy all day long. I said, you got to meet, right? <laughs> Grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Honey, it's where you're watering it that's greener, right? Don't be looking over there because I'm going to tell you, you know how God makes you die? Two ways. If you're married, he made you die because he looked the whole world over to find the most opposite person of you because he knew that one was going to be a tool of death. Right? And if you don't die enough with marriage, he'll kill you with children. <laughs> die! 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 Okay, now there's a bunch of singles out there going, they're gonna, they're gonna quit praying for a husband. <laughs> no, you're a tough nut to crack. <laughs> He's still looking. <laughs> or... He says, I will be your husband. But the purpose is death. Death to me. Because when I die, then the life of Christ can be manifested in me. Is that incredible or what? It involves death. Absolutely. He's so good. Okay. Let's see. Where am I? I get going. Uh, I lose my place. Oh, you want to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? You want to be the orange tree that's just taking in the sun, taking in the rain, and there goes the fruit. <laughs> Hallelujah. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Amen. Romans 8 is what we were just talking about, that he is doing a work in us. Turn to Romans 8 with me. I do want to go there a minute because I want to show you what the Holy Spirit's doing, what Jesus is doing, and what God the Father is doing. We already talked about that. Let's look at verses 26 and 27. 8, 26, 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Is that incredible? Yes. You have a prayer partner here. Yes. The Holy Spirit is interceding for you. I bet he's really groaning over me. I'm telling you, got to do something to this girl, God. He is interceding for us. Now, what God is doing is what we just talked about. Go down to verse 27 or 28. We know, do you know? That all things work together for good, for the purposes of good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to the purpose for whom he, God, foreknew. I told you he knew you before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So the Holy Spirit's interceding. God is working, and look at Jesus over to verse 34. Who is he who condemns? Have you been condemned? The enemy loves to condemn you. Your flesh loves to condemn you. The world loves to condemn you, but not Jesus. 
He does not condemn you. It says that in verse 1 of chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, period. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've accepted him as your Savior, you're not condemned any longer. You're covered in those robes of righteousness. So God accepts you. But it says, shall, says, who is even, a, let's see, I'll go back. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Holy Spirit, Jesus, and God, what a team. Working on our behalf. Isn't that exciting? I love it. So 1 John 12 and 13, if we love one another, it shows that God abides in us. It's the proof in the pudding. It's the Holy Spirit abiding in us. By this we know we abide in him and he in us because he's given of his spirit to us, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is a very important command. Look over there very quickly. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Oh, there goes the ding-dong bell. You know, if you don't finish on time, it said they, there's a hole that you drop down into, I've been told. Okay. So we got to hurry. 3, 5, and 6. Okay. I'm, where am I? 3? Is that right? Yes. Here it is. Okay. I'm going to give you a very, very amplified translation. My husband is, uh, he teaches Greek and Hebrew. So I don't know, me don't know with that. It's Greek to me, but he knows it. So he gave me this amplification of this scripture. Um, and this is how it goes. Continually trust in the Lord with all your heart. Continually trust in the Lord. Continually rely on the Lord with all your heart. And it's the Holy Spirit who enables us to keep trusting. Lean not on your own understanding. Hebrews describe, he, the, the, the language of Hebrew describes our understanding as this. You're skewed, misdirected, flawed, manipulative, fleshly strategy. Skewed, flawed, manipulative, misdirected, misdirected, fleshly strategy. Now think about it. Don't we get these strategies in our head? He said this, and now I'm going to say that. Or I'm going to get back at him. Or I'm never going to pray for her again. The way she treated me today at church. Well, see, she had a stomachache. So when she looked at you, she was like, I won't ever pray for her. And the, and the enemy's there because he's the accuser of the brethren say, yeah, she's a bad somebody. Can you believe she did that to you? And you've been so nice to her. I'll never be nice to her again. That's the fleshly strategy. Right? And we can do it toward anybody and everybody. I didn't like Pastor Derek's sermon. What's wrong with him? Oh, we're just so critical, aren't we? We're so looking for something. Oh, did you see what she did? You go to your girlfriend, you see what she did? You see what she did? Ooh-wee. Do you know that he hates those who spread strife amongst the brethren? Don't listen to that voice telling you to knock down your pastor or knock down your sisters or knock down whoever because that's your fleshly strategy. Lean not on your own fleshly strategy, but in all your ways. How many is all? All your ways acknowledge him. In all your ways know him intimately intensely know him and I intensely know him as I know his truth as I, he tells us who he is he tells us what he thinks he tells us what he likes what he dislikes what he loves what he hates he tells all of that to us in his word know him intensely intimately 
<coughs> and how do I do that? By abiding in his word, abiding in prayer, abiding in fellowship. That's what you're doing today. Do you know that? You're abiding in the Lord just by being here. You're abiding in, in thinking on him, singing to him, praising him, thinking about you and your relationship with him. That's abiding in him. And he says, this is the way. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your paths. That is a promise from God. What do we have? God loves us so much. He desires an intimate, personal relationship with you. And that blows my mind. In fact, when David wrote Psalm 139, he says, If I could count his thoughts toward me, they would outnumber the sand. Have you ever been down to the ocean? Have you ever gotten a cup of sand and tried to count the grains? I know a girl that did that. She broke her leg, and she was reading that. And she got a cup of sand, and she took a tablespoon and put it on her little tray in front of her. She's in bed with her leg up. She put it, and she started counting. And she gave up. She said, this is ridiculous. But that's what David said. Your thoughts toward me. And that's every one of you. His thoughts toward you would outnumber the sand. And David said, in my vernacular, it blows my mind. It blows mine too. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you, how we praise you, oh God, that you decided you wanted a relationship with us. Lord, we thank you that it's nothing of us. It's all you. Your love draws us to yourself. Oh, Jesus, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together, to focus on you, to focus on your word, to focus on what you're doing in us, Lord. We praise you for it. We give you glory. May, may our eyes be on you throughout this day. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.